today we have Keith and I presenting. So that's me on the left. Uh, my name's Alice. I'm part of the demand capacity team and I lead on a train the trainer program, which some of you may be aware of or may have been on. Um, and we also have Keith. Do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Morning, everyone. Uh, so my name is Keith Kimper. I'm the technical lead for the demand and capacity program. Um, we also have three of our colleagues who are joining us in the background today. So we've got, ah, here we go, Edwin's just switched his camera on. So we've got Vanessa and Natasha and Edwin, um, and they're doing a great team effort to make sure that questions in the chat box are responded to or directed to us as we go along. And also if you have any technical problems as you go along, they'll be able to help you troubleshoot them and, and get everything running smoothly. So please do put stuff in the chat box if there's any questions you've got or if there's anything that you're wondering about um, and we'll make sure that we pick those up as we go along. So just as an introduction, um, we're looking at the fundamentals of demand and capacity here, but we're also looking at it very much through the lens of COVID-19. So some things are the same as they've always been, some things are a little bit shifted. So particularly we're going to be looking at what's changed. So uh, the way that some services are delivered has obviously changed. So we're integrating across services in a different way. Virtual appointments are now becoming quite a large part of delivery for many services, whereas previously that might have been quite a small part of what was being delivered. Um, we're seeing patient behaviour change. So we're aware that people have got uh, more anxiety potentially about accessing services. Um, the non-attendance rates might be going up, um, but also people are, are interacting with services just in a different way. And then obviously there's a whole range of new considerations in terms of PPE, social distancing measures, etc. So we're just trying to look at a little bit of what has changed, but we'll also be really revisiting the fundamentals of what's not changed. So there's still things that are going to be the same going forward. So patients still need to be able to be seen in a timely manner. Um, and the, the modelling principles are very much the same. So we're looking at how those are going to be applied in a slightly different setting. So why do we need to do demand and capacity modelling? I'm hoping this isn't going to be a hard sell because you wouldn't have joined if you weren't at least somewhat believing this was true. But just to revisit some of the things that we've all seen in the headlines recently. So you've got um, cancellation of routine surgery for at least three months and that's had a huge impact. We're aware on how people, how long people are waiting um, and that patient experience, but also what's um, possible in terms of the services. Um, we had the peak of, hopefully we've seen the peak of the coronavirus and hopefully we won't have a second peak, but we're, we're certainly aware that that ongoing pattern and shape of the, the demand for corona services has changed, but also has had a massive impact on elective care. And then that's left a huge number of people waiting for services and treatment who would otherwise hopefully have been seen. So we're just, just kind of framing it a little bit. So here's just a little diagram of how we envisage people being able to use demand and capacity and how you might be able to integrate that into what you're doing in terms of the recovery phase and getting services back online again. So this webinar is very much looking at this first step here, which is the principles and the tools and making sure that they're fully understood, but it really does fit into this overall flow. So the bit that we'll teach you today is the theory, then the practice of it is really engaging on the ground with the people who are going to be impacted, the people you're working with, um, looking to populate a model. We provide a model um, and that can be accessed via our future NHS or you might be using your own models, but either way the principles are going to be the same. So the approach will be getting that data and understanding what that's saying about your services. And then really there's this flow diagram here where you're looking at does that match the reality of what's happening in my service and if it does hopefully you'll be able to use that and we're looking at a planning kind of horizon of about six to eight weeks at the moment we realize things are changing very very fast so in lots of ways it's about getting people through that first bit of the recovery phase as things are being stepped up um, and then once that's happened revisiting it because the six to eight weeks after the six to eight weeks could well be very different again. 
So just to kind of revisit some of the basics, we've got a quick glossary here, um, and this is just running through some terms to make sure we're using them and understanding them in the same way. So when we talk about demand, we're talking about the totality of requests for a service. So it doesn't matter where the demand is coming from. The source isn't really relevant, um, but we're looking at all of the requests. And in a community of mental health, this might um, be an existing caseload um, and looking at the requirements for those patients. Uh, required capacity or supply, if you're thinking about it in a demand and supply, supply and demand um, framework is what needs to be provided to meet that demand. So we're looking at what's coming in and then what we would need to be able to to meet that. Um, available capacity is the resources we've got to allocate to that. Um, and then you've got your queues and waiting list, which is people who have not yet been seen by the service, but are coming through. Um, and activity is what's actually being delivered. And I think it's really, really clear, really um, important to distinguish activity and demand as being quite separate things. Um, and I think there's often a lot of focus on activity, but when we're looking at our calculations, we really need to understand what the demand is. So as I said, demand is not activity. They're two quite separate things. Um, but what we're looking at is if you have a mismatch between what you require as your capacity and what you actually have as your capacity, that's when your waiting lists are likely to grow. And I think that's something that we will have seen a lot of in the last few weeks. Um, and the longer your waiting list is, the longer patients are going to wait. Um, it's not a particularly complicated concept, but it's just a kind of key underpinning of everything that we're, we're going to be looking at. And this applies to all processes. So whether you're using our model or not, or however you do your modelling and however you look at your services, this is going to be true. So we're just going to have a little look at pathway mapping. Um, so what is pathway mapping and what do we mean when we say that? Here's a quick definition from the ACT Academy, which is quite a nice little potted summary of what it is and what we're looking at. So it allows you to create a visual representation of the relative steps and patient service user journey. And you can use these tools to enable everyone involved to really understand the different steps of the journey, see the overall picture and understand how complicated that journey can be. Um, and we realise that for a lot of you, that pathway may have shifted. So in terms of why we think demand capacity is going to be relevant to do pathway mapping now, there may well be a new process. So in terms of how people are seeing patients, we're hearing a lot of um, anecdotal information that it's really shifted and that actually that um, focus and how things are being done has changed quite radically. Um, we're also looking at where are we now and recognising that that's not where we necessarily want to be in the six to eight week horizon that we're looking at. Um, we're hoping to expose some of the complexity and waste, but also learn from some of the improvements that have been made. So there's been huge changes in a really very short amount of time um, and some of these changes might be ones that we want to keep so it's about trying to make sure that we capitalize on those benefits um, at the same time as realizing that they may or may not go forward and it can help us to find bottlenecks and constraint to target resources during the recovery phase so if there are particular areas that we realize are a constraint to the overall pathway it's a lot easier to see that in a visual format than it is just on paper um, and it can allow you to really kind of prioritise how you're going to use your resources. And it can also help to see things from a patient's perspective. So it's about understanding what their journey would feel like as much as it is about understanding our processes and, and how they would map through. So talking of those different processes and those different perspectives, so we've got a um, kind of visual representation of a service here. So this might be how the service thinks of their pathway. So you've got a two week wait referral, you might have a first outpatient appointment, some form of diagnostics, a follow up appointment, there may be a staging diagnostics, follow up outpatient, and then you might be looking at multidisciplinary teams, treatment, follow up outpatient and discharge. So that conceivably is how a service might be thinking about it. 
terms of the targets and what people are kind of measuring you against or the bits that people check, it might just be these points. So as much as for your service understanding, that whole pathway is going to be really important, relevant for the bits that are getting measured externally, it could well just be these bits. But for the patient, it's probably quite a different experience again. So for the patient, it might look something a bit more like what's wrong with me? When will I be seen? When will I know what's wrong with me? What will my treatment be? When will it start and end? And has it worked? So it's it's quite a different sort of understanding and um, narrative, I think, for the patient other than for us and maybe for our commissioners. So your pathway probably isn't going to look like this. This is slightly simplistic just to put the point across. Your pathway might look a bit more like this. So you could well have um, people coming in and then following a whole range of different pathways as they go through. Um, so it's, and we realise that sometimes even this might be a bit more simplistic than what you're looking at. But going through the process can really help to kind of unpick those, those complexities. Um, places where we think things might have changed, um, but it will be different for every service. Here around when you're looking at your different clinics and you're triaging into different places, you may actually have found more efficient ways of doing things during the rapid changes in the last few months. So it's about revisiting that and thinking, OK, so this is what we used to do and this is how it used to work. Um, what do we expect it to be looking like going forward? There are also um, places where you might be able to be doing remote consultation. I mean, it will vary a lot from service to service. So in some places you might be looking at a mix of virtual and face to face and with others you might be looking at doing just one or the other. But again, it's likely to be quite different from the pathway that you were looking at before. So it's just revisiting that and having a little look. So um, we're going to talk about demand and then capacity uh, in short order. I think um, Alice mentioned earlier on one of the really important things to note when we talk about demand, it's often conflated with activity and those two things aren't the same thing. So often when we talk about measuring demand, um, the easiest proxy we have is to look at what we did over the last year or so or, or, or something like that. Um, and one of the really important things to note about this is that um, your activity isn't really a measure of your demand. It's a measure of what you actually did. Um, and that itself can actually be affected by, by a range of things. So that could be based on limitations of your capacity. So you might be having hidden demand somewhere that simply wasn't able to be seen. Um, and it's um, those and it could also be affected by how frequently patients are actually turning up for their appointment if they're having multiple appointments because they DNA'd uh, and then have to be um, seen multiple times, for example, all those things can actually affect um, your activity measurements. So in the first instance, actually understanding what your demand is in terms of looking at whether or not, um, for example, for a first outpatient, you're talking about referrals in, or if you're talking about later parts of the pathway, like a follow up, you're looking at the previous part of the pathway. So it might be the immediately preceding appointment and whether or not the patient was discharged, having a clear idea of what what your actual source of demand is and making sure you're accounting for all of it is a really important step in terms of being able to quantify it. Um, so once you've actually got that, and that that's actually very much a, a, a quite an involved piece of work, um, a very much um, a combined piece of work between your informatics department and your operational team in terms of trying to link up the right data points. Um, so that's an involved piece of work in itself. But once we've gotten to that point, um, then actually figuring out what you actually do with that data is, is kind of the next step, really. So one of the really important things to note is that when we talk about forecasts of future demand, um, especially when it's predicated on historical demand, it's a view of what might have what might happen, assuming things work kind of the same. Um, and if that's all the information you have, that that may be um, the best the best that you can do. But the key thing is that it's not a guaranteed uh, predictor of what's going to happen because life happens, quite frankly. Um, so 
in terms of actually how we view the tool, quite there, there's there's sometimes a prevailing mindset that if you have a forecast, that's exactly what's going to happen. And if it doesn't work according to your forecast, then the forecast is the issue, um, which which isn't always quite the right way to go about it. Um, I think if we if we look at forecasts for demand as ways to improve our decision making and risk mitigation strategies, that's perhaps a more nuanced view. Um, and, and that kind of helps us get the most out of the information that we have, because then we're talking about possible scenarios and then how we actually deal with different scenarios and it gives us more flexibility in our thinking. So um, that's particularly relevant and I realise I've, I've just kind of gone on for a bit, but that the reason I've gone on to that is because in the post COVID-19 world, we don't have historical data uh, because a lot of things have changed. So we're going to have to make some great huge assumptions and actually when it comes to demand, um, we're going to be working in the dark really and some of this stuff quite frankly will be a bit of an educated guess so let's see if we can get onto the next slide there we go so this is a pretty typical um, example of what might actually um, happen when it comes to looking at your demand um, so we've got something that's happening um, before covid uh, the, your historical kind of baseline levels and then the restriction in elective care might lead to a drop in in your demand and then we might end up going back up. And the important thing to note is during these periods, um, what we're having is not just like a straight line where things are bimbling around. You've, we've still got what we call natural variation occurring all the way through these. And that's that's really important because in terms of what's going to happen when we come back to some baseline level of normal is that we're still going to have to account for 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 this natural variation and have to figure out um, kind of what's what's normal for that variation. And our service needs to be planned so that it takes account of that variation. So this is kind of one of those fundamentals that Alice was mentioning right at the start that hasn't changed. So the level of normal might have changed, but the actual fundamental principles of having to account for these this this variation hasn't. And that's really important to 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 um, to keep in mind. So one of the things that we have to just help us assess um, this whole concept of what's normal and um, if if our data sets, for example, are stable, so have we reached some level where we can start to predict from historical demand, is this tool called SPC charts, statistical process control. And it helps us answer some of these questions. Have we reached a new level of normal? Is it stable? Um, and how can we, can we uh, differentiate um, things that are varying in a normal manner from highly unusual things? highly unusual circumstances. Um, so what the SPC chart helps us do is just pick out particular trends. If there's a what we call a paradigm shift and the, the COVID, the change from normal levels to COVID levels is a really good example of paradigm shift um, or things like extreme outliers such as Easter or Christmas where things aren't happening as we'd normally expect in terms of business as usual. So for the medium short term, um, we're going to use these tools because they're quite well, but they're, 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 de I'm sorry, they're developed for industry and they're quite well designed to help pick out short term trends. So this this is a, a pretty useful tool for that kind of time series analysis. Um, so this is what an SPC chart looks like and um, rather usefully um, what we've done with with the charts that we've designed in the tools that we provide and what's what's a fairly standard sort of thing in SPC tools in general is they will they've got a set of rules that will flag when something odd has occurred um, and you don't for for all effects and purposes all you need to know for example is it's, it's highlighting a potential trend and it's pretty obvious in cases like this um, and that, that can be used to help you figure out if you've got a change occurring and and it's kind of obvious here but it's if you're resetting your baseline as you go along, that will actually also help you determine whether or not you've reached a new level of baseline. So if you've gone from your during COVID restricted elective care back up to some level of of kind of background normal, it'll help you just tell tell if you're actually still in that phase where you're going back up or if you're actually reaching some level of stability in your in your data set. And that's really important for planning your service and figuring out uh, where you're going to be, say, six months down the line. Okay, so let's just move to the next slide. Okay, oh, there we go. So yeah, the, the short version of FSPC analysis is if you see a hash of red marks, then it's, or, or warning signs, then then something isn't normal there. So you're basically, you've not got a stable data set. 
um, if you are having no um, highlights, then that's an indication that your data set is what we call normal from a control perspective. And that means that um, the data set is stable. And if you use that as your baseline for going forward, then it will probably be um, very similar uh, in the future. There's a pretty good likelihood that um, that's a good predictor for what you're actually going to be seeing next. Um, there's a lot of resources on SPC out there, um, so there are a couple of uh, there are a couple of resources that we've listed here. There's a video that's um, that that we produced, as well as the um, making data count um, resources from NHS Improvement made by our colleagues, uh, which are both excellent. We will be sending out um, or we will be making the slides available um, after this webinar, so um, don't need to scribble if if you if you um, if you're frantically writing, uh, and we will have recorded the webinar as well. Uh, but there's just a few resources that are available. So in terms of accounting for variation, um, so I mentioned that um, we expect demand to be going up and down over time. How do we actually make sure that we set our capacity at the right level so that our waiting list isn't growing over time? Because um, fundamentally, if we set it at the average, and this is kind of one of the key things that often happens, if we use just the average, what we're actually saying is we're going to get our estimate of demand wrong half of the time, because half the time it's going to be above our available capacity. And the interaction of, of, um, of actually meeting that demand is such that if you, if you set it at the average, your waiting list will generally go up over time, because you're getting it wrong half the time. Um, so, the question then is, what's the right level to set it at? So, ooh, have we got a question? Nope, it's just a joke. So, um, where where do we actually set this at? And this is where some of um, what we call lean theory comes in. So, there are some mathematics that will actually allow you to calculate a sensible level for um, for pitching your capacity relative to the variation in the demand that comes through. Um, so in this example, we can see four patients per week, 18 patients per week or something in the middle based on uh, based on this spread of of demand. Um, and if I go to the next slide. There we go. Um, what we use is the percentile of variation. So I mentioned that, you know, if you if you put it, if you put your capacity right in the middle, you're getting it wrong half the time, more or less. Um, We've got some videos, tutorial videos that will explain in a bit more detail um, how you actually pick the right percentile of variation. Um, so classic lean theory is you set it at the 80th percentile so that you meet the demand 80% of the time. And if you do that, that means that 80% of the time your capacity be, will be either sufficient or in excess of what you need to deal with the demand at a given point in time. And then 20% of the time it'll be less. But what that means is in combination with a waiting list that gives you enough flexibility that you will basically be able to absorb any peaks in demand that come through uh, and it won't impact your waiting times for your patients as much. Um, so I mentioned the 80th percentile is, is what's commonly used in industry um, and that's based on some mathematical formula based on um, a type of maths called queuing theory. But um, in practice, what we found with our colleagues from the intensive support teams is that the 65th percentile for some elective um, services will be sufficient, um, especially in the cases where you've got um, large services that are relatively stable. So with regards to COVID, um, there will be some additional factors that are affecting your demand. Um, so in the first instance, because we don't have any data about what the return to baseline will be, um, one of the assumptions that we're making in our modeling going forward is that um, as a start for 10, we're going back to our historic levels of baseline. So we're historic levels of demand. So we assume that that's basically going to be where we start off with. If you've got any um, epidemiological modeling that will help you forecast in a in a more predictive way, then we recommend, if, especially if you're confident in that, um, that you use that information. But this is kind of our start for 10. And it's important to note that with regards to that, um, there will be two types of backlog effectively uh, when you when you return to your your kind of normal levels of demand. Uh, one is your existing backlog, which presumably would have been paused um, or or kept kind of relatively the same uh, during the, the elective care pause. But also during the shaded period, um, the assumption would the, the implicit assumption of, use, of saying that we've got a historic level of, of, of demand kind of that we're going to return to is that there's a hidden 
cohort of patients that we haven't actually seen across this shaded period. Um, and there basically are what I would call unseen cases. So it's not like patients get better automatically if they don't turn up for referrals or they're, they're not seeing their GPs. There's still a need for those patients to be seen and they're going to be turning up at some point in the future. So that's going to be one of the questions we're going to have to try uh, quantify. The second one is what's the rate of return to normal? So this 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 line going up here back to our baseline level. The question is what's what's that going to be stretched out over a period of weeks? You know, how many weeks is that going to take? Um, because that will also have an impact and some of that will be dependent on um, the willingness of patients to come out and be seen. Um, but it's also worth considering um, steps prior to your service. So, for example, if you're taking referrals in from um, from primary care, um, there might be a double lag effect of patients needing to go see their GP first and then that GP referring them on to um, your service. Um, so um, there might be that might actually stretch out the timelines because there's there's that need for patients to go through two steps in order to get to your service. So those are considerations that might you might need to bear in mind as part of your strategy for how you're actually going to be reopening your service. Um, in terms of what the new level of normal will be, um, I mentioned that our initial assumption is that you would go back to your historic levels um, prior to the onset of, of COVID and the elective care lockdown. Um, thinking ahead six months plus, it might that might, would probably be about the right time to start considering what the new level of normal might be to check if that's actually the case, um, because there might be changes. For example, um, if you're looking at um, your your base population or acuity, um, there might be differences uh, because of because of um, the lockdown in terms of what what your available population might be. There might have been uh, pathway changes. So um, based on the pathway ma mapping, you might have you might be seeing changes in how patients are actually flowing through your system uh, and what the pinch points are and how that might affect your service. So those those might affect what's actually coming in. Um, and there might be behavioural changes in terms of willingness of patients to be going out and uh, being in contact with health services based on, on what's going on. So the bits in dark blue, these two items, we probably have a bit of data on that. We can make a guess on that. But these two items um, in light blue, it's li unlikely that we actually have that information at present in, in the way we record data. So in some of these cases, we'd really recommend having a chat with clinical and operational leads just to get a sense of what they feel might be going on and using that to inform um, your decision making uh, because that gives you at least some platform to, to be making some some initial kind of uh, uh, plans on. When we talk about capacity, we're, we're talking about the ability to meet demand. Um, and a good starting point is obviously how many clinical slots you have available. Um, so I think one of the things I mentioned just now was that there's a lot of unknowns on the demand side. Um, and to be frank, we're, we are taking a bit of a leap in the dark on that kind of stuff. Um, the, the side that we do actually have a bit more knowledge of or that we can find some more concrete information about is the capacity end. So there's a lot of changes that have ha occurred in your capacity as well. So for those of you who've already done um, um, capacity assessment and done a lot of work in looking at what your capacity is, you know, what you're actually able to meaningfully get through, there may be changes that have actually occurred. And it's really important to try quantify some of this stuff because um, there will be additional effects that are coming through, um, practical effects in terms of things like social distancing that will Im impact your, your ability to actually um, deliver care to patients. Um, and in some ways, actually being able to quantify that, like the, the maximum capacity that you can actually have in terms of throughput might be um, might be kind of the most useful output you can put uh, you can put together across the next couple of weeks because that will give you an indication of um, almost the red line for your service in terms of what what you can actually maximally get through um, because to be frank the the demand it's going to be potentially all over the place and and the best that, that we might be able to do in the interim is actually uh, put some numbers around what we can actually do in the interim. Um, the other thing to actually take account of is that there will be new ways of working and that may actually improve um, your throughput uh, or your capability to see patients. So teleworking might actually have um, give in, improve the ability because it's removing travel time for domiciliary services, for example. So these are all sorts of um, things that you might that you'll you'll probably need to be factoring in as you as you 
as you kind of go through the process. Um, so there will be a number of factors affecting your available capacity. Uh, in terms of the, the baseline, if you've already got historic um, information from previous rotors, previous kind of capacity assessments, as well as transformation plans, um, that's always a really good starting point because that gives you um, a solid baseline to work from. But uh, I mentioned there, there might be pathway changes. Um, and what we found is trust, some trusts have found um, this an opportunity to put through really helpful transformation changes and simplify their pathways for the benefit of patients. Um, and capturing that might be really helpful. Um, that might result in changes in length of contact, uh, adjustments to ways of new working. There might be infection control processes that will slow things down. You might need to put on PPE for face-to-face -face contact, might need to be cleaning that takes place um, in theatres, for example. So actually quantifying what that what that is in terms of quick time and motion studies uh, might be a really good starting point just to help get get a sense of what's actually going on. Um, the other aspect is upstream or downstream dependencies. Um, and this is something I like to bang on quite a lot about because I think it's really important to understand the whole flow process. So that's why the pathway mapping that Alice was talking about is so, so important. Um, and there will be potentially new constraints in your pathway. So a, an example of that is um, we spoke to a chemo service um, just a, a couple of weeks ago and they mentioned that um, one of their wards had been taken over for dialysis to treat COVID patients. So basically out of three wards that they had, uh, one was out of action and and now they had to figure out because they'd actually done the quantification, they, they knew what the capability was with those two, but it meant that they'd knocked out um, their main site and they were having to juggle patients around. So um, there may be kind of unexpected um, spanners being thrown in the works because of reallocation of resources uh, in that kind of means. So checking checking where that is and, check, and quantifying it will be a, a really important step in terms of making sure that you can plan on, on, on useful data. Uh, and obviously there's also the staffing availability in terms of COVID consideration. So if you've got staff who are um, sick or on long term sick because of COVID related illness, then that's that's going to be uh, a consideration. The other one is also burnout and annual leave. Um, so if you have staff who've been deployed um, to to support um, the COVID effort, um, there's a pretty good chance they'll need some sort of um, r and in the next couple of months. Um, so being able to actually plan around that and making sure that you're rotating your staff effectively um, to maximize their their um, their 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 rest, um, appropriate rest will be be maybe something that you actually need to factor in. Uh, similarly for redeployment, if you've got staff that are still um, supporting uh, COVID treatments in some form or other, then that's that's another thing that you'll really need to to be taken account of. Um, the other one that might be worth thinking about is that changeover to new way, ways of working will also have some sort of impact in that there's time required to get to grips with new technologies, for example, if you're teleworking, because um, I mean, even within our team, getting to grips with teams uh, is, hasn't always been a smooth process and we've been it's been a learning curve. And similarly, if you're if you're interacting with patients in a new way uh, via teleworking, then the patients also have to get used to to video calls as well as the staff. And that's something that might need to kind of ramp up over time in terms of familiarity and effectiveness. So um, all sorts of a future things just to be considering when you're actually thinking about what your capacity is like. Um, so once you've quantified your capacity, the next things that you need to do is actually figure out how much is actually required because demand does get adjusted by by things like non attendances. And if patients don't turn up, they'll need to be rebooked. And if you've lost the slot, then you're basically using two slots for one patient. So in terms of um, looking at the effect of COVID on, on this sort of stuff, it'll be a case of there are potentially, um, you're potentially seeing higher rates of DNAs but in the future, maybe. So um, this might be, once again, a discussion within with your, with your clinical teams about what they're actually expecting coming through, um, especially if you've got um, specific time slots for your patients if you're working in in areas like mental health and learning disabilities where that might be challenging for your patients to attend on time you might be expecting higher rates of dnas and things like that um, so that's that's quite mathsy looking let's let's just kind of put this into a practical flow diagram because um, i'm an analyst and i like flow diagrams so in terms of what we're looking at if you have demand coming through um, say 100 patients you might have some patients that will that will not be treated because they they kind of leave the waiting list for whatever reason. Um, perhaps they've been waiting quite some time and they decide that you know they're okay actually. 
Um, that's what we call referrals other than treatment, so they never need to be booked a slot in the first instance. You might also get patients who cancel their appointment ahead of time um, and decide and for whatever reason don't need to be seen. Um, so these are early notice cancellations that are then discharged. So those are two groups of patients that you don't need to actually take account of when you're looking at your clinical slots required. So straight away, um, your demand is being adjusted and you go from 100 slots to 90. Now, I mentioned if you've got patients who are doing short notice cancellations, DNAs, um, you're likely going to lose the slot in those instances. So we might have a DNA rate where you end up losing 20 patients or 20 patients don't turn up. Depending on your access policy and how you're applying it, um, some of those patients may be discharged, but the remainder will need to be seen again. So that's your rebooking rate and those patients then need to be added back into the clinical slots required. So instead of having 100 slots, first of all, in the initial pass, you need 90. And then with the addition of the rebookings for non-attendances, you need 105. But in terms of the actual number of patients you've treated or seen, um, and this is kind of the activity that you're counting, um, you'd be seeing 85 because of the 90, five got discharged without being seen. So hopefully you can see from here why we talk about demand measurement being important as being seen as different to activity, because here we're actually seeing 85 patients. That's your activity. The demand was actually 100 for what well, referrals or requests for clinical slots coming in, and the actual number of slots you needed to provide was 105. So hopefully that, that quick walkthrough gives you a sense of how the dynamics of um, of patient attendances will actually affect the number of slots you need to put on and how that differs from the actual activity you're putting on. So once you've done the work around looking at what your demand is or understanding what your your best guess at the moment is for what your demand is going to be and your capacity, which will have changed, obviously. You then need to do what we call a sense checking process. So I think this bit is really, really crucial and I would definitely stress don't rush through it. So I think there's often this very natural tendency. You do a huge amount of work getting the numbers right or what feels right. And then you're like, oh, brilliant. I've got this thing and I want to present it to someone. I'm really excited about what I've done. Um, but I would really encourage people to just pause and really thoroughly sense check. And if you can, I realise that um, depending on where people are redeployed to, etc., it can be harder to get hold of the people that you want to than normal. But if you can sense check it with people who are on the front line in that service, it makes a massive difference. They will have a gut feel of whether it's right or not. Them saying it's wrong doesn't mean it is wrong. But it's definitely worth kind of picking in and, and kind of checking that out a bit. Um, but having said that, I would also stress that you are looking for data that's good enough rather than perfect. So we, as Keith said, we're in kind of uncharted territory really in terms of what demand we're expecting um, and all of the different variables that are impacting our capacity at the moment. So I think in terms of a whole range of things, you're not likely to be able to get to that perfect figure of exactly what it's going to be. Be kind to yourselves, get to a point where you've got something you can work with um, and that you're able to move forward using and then use that and just tweak it as you go along. I think there's there's a lot that we don't know, but having a bit of data can make a massive difference in terms of that that decision making process. So to revisit what we were looking at earlier, so this flow diagram, what we've covered today is very much the, the tools and the principles and those underpinning um, methodologies. That, that first bit, I can't, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse when I move it or not, but that first bit that we circled earlier on. Now, I think we're really encouraging you to look at the bit that's circled in red now. So does the model match service reality? Um, and if it does, that's great. Um, so then you can start using it for that six to eight week horizon that we talked about. Um, and then once you're looking at that six to eight week horizon, you're probably going to need to loop back around again to remodel it. So continuing to kind of update that data, revisit those assumptions, make sure that it's still true. If it's not matching reality, I think it's about doing a little bit of detective work. Um, but first, I'd like to say don't be disheartened. 
most people who have done demand and capacity modeling and got the most out of it have done several of these iterations. Um, so I think it's it's quite normal that it's not quite right the first time round. Stick with it. But it's about looking at all of those assumptions that you made right at the start, um, maybe tweaking them and using the model to kind of tweak each of the little bits until you get something that does feel like it gives you a good enough a good enough kind of fit with reality and with what you're seeing on the ground. So then what next? What we're really hoping is that these modeling approaches and um, methodologies will help you to to drive better decision making using data as a basis. So it can be used for your activity and business planning, um, service flow analysis, job planning. So it, it has a whole range of applications that will hopefully really practically help you to, to keep running your services. And I think in a way, particularly with everything being so fluid and and it being so uncharted at the moment, it's probably a particularly useful time to have something to anchor to a little bit, because then if you if you're making your assumptions and it's not quite right, at least you have a systematic and methodological way of of tweaking things and, and hopefully getting getting to that end point. I want to say thank you very much for dialing in. Yes, and hope you have a good rest of the week. <laughs>